Off a day, I'm Don Sulat, and welcome to this episode of Coffee with the Candidates. And today, I'm joining with write-in candidate, attorney Pete Santos. Half a day, attorney. Half a day, Don. And so let's get right into it. So can you tell us who you are, your background, and why you're choosing to run in as a writing candidate instead of going instead of running during the primary? Okay, so I'm Pete Santos. I am from the village of Agate. I was born dirt poor in a tin shack with no indoor plumbing. Uh, lived my whole life up until I graduated high school on public assistance, welfare, food stamp, Section 8 when we moved out of uh, the shack because it was destroyed by Typhoon Pamela. Uh, we moved to California uh, to go, you know, seek better opportunities. Unfortunately, my mom fell into drugs and we lived homeless for a while in California. And then my godmother scooped us up. We went to Washington, uh, Washington State, finished high school, immediately came back to Guam and joined the police department where I served for eight years. I got my bachelor's degree through the Doc Sanchez program and I went active duty army. In the army, I deployed four times, Iraq and Afghanistan. And then Uncle Sam decided, you know, send me to law school. So I went to law school. After that, I came back and was working at the prosecutor's office. Didn't want to leave the prosecutor's office. Uh, took a big, huge pay cut actually going to work at the prosecution. Took a 40% pay cut. And I also gave up a $60,000 uh, retention bonus in the military, but I wanted to be a prosecutor. Uh, I was hired under Elizabeth Barrett Anderson. And then when uh, Levin Camacho, the current AG, took over, things drastically changed. And myself and majority of the other prosecutors left because of the poor conditions up there. So anyways, here I am running as a write-in. Um, I get that question a lot, Don. But the important thing is, right now, Guam has three candidates to choose from, right? We have seen the track record of Doug Morden. We have seen the dismal state that we're in under Levin Camacho. And if you look at my experience as a law enforcement officer, as a uh, army JAG, as a prosecutor, as a magistrate in the military, I'm the only one of the candidates that rose through the ranks and worked in the trenches and understands how to fix the problems that we're facing. So my platform is of course, priority number one, fix prosecution, get it at least functional. Cause right now it's dysfunctional. It's in critical condition. It's about to flatline. We're losing more prosecutors. We're not getting more prosecutors. All right. I have good, I have that on good authority. Every AG has their area of emphasis, like Alicia Limtiaco, her area of emphasis, if you recall, was human trafficking, right? She wanted to fight human trafficking. Doug Moylan's area of emphasis was persecuting his political enemies, if you recall. Uh, Leaving Camacho doesn't have an area of emphasis in crime fighting. He's been protecting his buddies and friends and uh, family business interests. So those are, that's his area of interest, right? Uh, protecting his, his uh, affiliates. And so my area of interest is protecting the children and the manamco. In my time as a law enforcement officer, in my time as a prosecutor, in my time as a defense attorney, the vulnerable victims are the ones that bother me the most, that hit me the most. I can, you know, uh, have no problem prosecuting or defending uh, robberies and murders, but when there are cases involving small children or elderly that are vulnerable, that is the area that I want to make sure does not go unpunished. Right. And can you, are you able to go into more details on how you're uh, if you become the next AG, how you're able to protect those most vulnerable? Well, just like Alicia Limtiaco made it her priority for human trafficking, I want to do a multifaceted approach. Of course, there is programs and education out there, you know, to deal with the issue of child abuse and elder abuse. You know, I want to shore those up, but I also want to emphasize to the prosecutors that this area of prosecution where the victims are the vulnerable young children and the vulnerable elderly, this will be a non-negotiable. 
all right? Right now, there's a lot of plea bargaining. Plea bargaining is a part of every criminal justice system. It's indispensable. It is a useful tool. But right now, the AG's office is plea bargaining from an area of weakness, from a position of weakness, not from a position of strength. Because the criminals know and the defendants know that the AG's office right now is incompetent. And so they're all wanting to go to trial because they're willing to roll the dice that we're going to go to trial and they're going to get a, an acquittal. Uh, we've had, I think, seven straight acquittals in the last uh, month. Right, right. And going back into the platform and everything, current, the current AGs has a partnership, ongoing partnership with uh, the, admin, the administration over the Adaloot. If elected, do you think that you'll continue working uh, because you did mention a multifaceted approach, would you be continuing uh, to push to work together with other administrations, other departments to help combat, to help protect your platform, as you said, the, those most vulnerable? Yes. Well, that is a little bit of a, a different question. So the attorney general's role is, of course, to be the chief prosecutor, the chief law enforcement officer of the island. But he also has other duties. Right. We have other divisions like child support, civil, consumer protection, and then also, yes, providing legal services to those agencies who do not have organic legal services to in, the, in their own organizations, right? There, there is a law that says that some organizations uh, can hire their own legal, but if they're a smaller organization, then uh, they, they cannot, right? So they have to, they actually do pay the attorney general's office to provide legal services. However, from what I'm hearing from the stakeholders, from people in these smaller agencies, from different commissions and boards, from different private organizations, the services that they are receiving right now, or for more accurately to describe it, not receiving right now, is very frustrating. And so I have experienced before as a chief of administrative law in the Army, and I dealt with procurement, contracts, um, all kinds of you know, civil matters. And we used certain systems to make sure that our services were delivered quickly and accurately. And so I will bring those processes and systems over to the Attorney General's office. Those other divisions right now actually employ the most highest paid attorneys in the Attorney General's office. And so there should be no excuse, Don, why it's taking three years for the Guam Association of Realtors who have asked for a legal opinion from the Attorney General's office. Three years they asked for a legal opinion, and to this date, nothing. So I will bring my experience in making sure that the services that the AG's office is legally required to give to the public and to the government agencies happens timely and accurately. Understood. And uh, continuing on with your experience and how you're going to use that if elected as the next AG, uh, the ongoing discussion right now, the, the hot craze in all, the, in all media is the illegal backdoor entry of foreign nationals from the CNMI. So how would you use that if, the, if you're elected as the next AG to help combat this issue and help, and help mitigate that or help uh, bring them to justice? Because even though they are here for what they say is a better life, whatever the excuse may be, we still have to put them through the due process because they are not enter they're not entering through a legal means. So. Well, first we have to fully understand the problem, right? And you hit on some of it. So they were here legally, they went into Saipan, and then they came down to Guam. As far as the federal government is concerned, they didn't do anything wrong. It is our laws that have been violated. But the, quest, the, the same approach I would have to this is the same approach I would have with drugs, right? Stop it at the source. Work with our CNMI counterparts, work with our federal counterparts to interdict and prevent it from even, when I say it, I'm talking about drugs or illegal um, migration, prevent that from happening, okay? Prevent that from 
coming to Guam in the first place. So pony up all the resources, you know, gather up all the resources and find out who are, because these, these folks that are coming over, they're not just, you know, strolling over to the beach and then stealing a boat and coming. It's a really coordinated and concerted effort. So what we have to do is we have to stop it at the source. We have to make sure that whoever is running this operation between Guam and the CNMI, we got to take them out. Understood. And we do have time for one more question. And I wanted to bring it up regarding your uh, uh, solution to tackling Guam's drug problem. You see it all around right now, especially this election season. You see uh, propaganda, you see billboards saying the prices of drugs right now is cheaper more so than ever. How, how would you tackle it at the source? How would you, as if becoming the next AG, how would you help stop this issue? Because you see right now, a lot of the magistrates reports uh, almost daily, it's possession of drug, possession of meth. So how would you tackle well, that? Well, let's step back for a minute. So we got to realize and face reality, okay? Drugs is going to be a part of almost every community. There's very rarely any community that you can find that is drug free. Right. So abuse of drugs and abuse of other things. It could be gambling. It could be drugs. It's a human nature thing. Right. So it's going to be there. So then comes the question, OK, how do we stem it? Right. Because we can never eradicate it. How do we stem it? How do we slow it down? OK. I was the senior drug prosecutor up at the at the uh, prosecution office. I worked with the Mandana task force. I worked with um, some of our federal counterparts. Right. I also did the training on the rehabilitative court, uh, the, the therapy courts. So it has to be a multifaceted approach. But again, the number one thing is interdiction. The number one thing is stopping it from getting into Guam in the first place. Now, it's more prevalent now because a lot more people are getting into the game, more of the cartels, more of the uh, some businesses, right? Are, investing in this kind of uh, black market activity. And so uh, it's more available. That's why you see the prices come down because there's more suppliers. So what we have to do is we have to work together with our federal and local counterparts and use our resources and our information to try to target the main sources coming in. We're not going to get all of them. So fighting drugs is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But if you pool your resources and you share your information, then we can get better results. In other words, using our limited resources more intelligently and more smartly. Right? Or what I've seen in the past, both in my time as a prosecutor and my time as law enforcement, is that the different agencies that are involved are kind of weary of each other, kind of stingy with information. So a lot of times, you know, the left hand and the right hand are duplicating work or they don't know what each other is doing. And so sometimes it might even work against each other. My philosophy and my approach is to get everybody together that want to have the same outcome and figure out, okay, what resources do you have? What resources do I have? What information do you have? What information do I have? And, and let's, use it together. And uh, in the military, we call it a synergy, right? When multiple you know, agencies get together and we do a concerted effort, then you can have that synergy. And I think, and I believe, and I know that that is the most effective way to try to combat drugs and, and make a dent. You know, we gotta continue with the therapy courts and the rehabilitation. We have to continue with locking up people if they need to be locked up, but uh, we gotta work together. Understood. Thank you so much, attorney. And I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I know you do have a busy day as a practicing attorney still. So uh, let's best of luck in this upcoming general election, sir. Thank you. And uh, write me in, Peter Santos. Thank and you very much. Thank you so much. And that does it for this part of Coffee with the Candidates. Stay tuned. And until next time.